we thought we would start even before an introduction of uh, Ron's uh, books and works with a little video of the vitrine that we're gonna, our talk will come out of today. So let me just share, this is about a 40 second video um, that was made by Tobias Cropper um, of the vitrine that Nancy Cool created. So let me play it for you first. So Ron, welcome. Thank you, Karen, hi. Hi, here is, um, I thought a way, a way to begin um, to talk about the materials that came from your papers in that wonderful vitrine, um, which if you go to the Beinecke is up the staircase at the very top of the staircase, um, is that we're gonna, everything we're gonna talk about today is from your papers. And um, you're the author of, more than 20 books of poetry, translations, two memoirs. Um, you've received a Guggenheim. Your collected poems um, was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize and the Los Angeles, you won a Los Angeles Times Book Prize and the William Carlos Williams um, Prize from the Poetry Society of America. And, um, and, and we're gonna turn from all of those published works for a little while to the, papers, which are my favorite papers um, at the Beinecke. And, uh, and as you know, I, I love um, to work within them. They're, um, for those of you that want to know the scope of them, they're 143 boxes. It's 120 feet, cubic feet, uh, linear feet of, of material. And, uh, and there's more coming still. So I thought that that one way to talk through what's in these boxes is to go back kind of to the beginning and to talk about um, some of the locations that have been incredibly important to you. So I thought we'd begin with Tulsa, which is where you're from. Yeah, both Joe and I grew up in Tulsa and uh, uh, had a kind of love-hate relationship with the town. and. Uh, what we're seeing here now is a postcard I sent Joe. Um, I don't remember, it's not, I don't see the date on this, but uh, you see the front and the back, the insane uh, fishing postcard. And so at the end, that's why I say, as for Tulsa, it's living surrealism. Um, the, or <laughs> below that, it says the sportsman's dream, take your pick. Uh, I thought but, maybe it was around the mid seventies because you write, uh, how's I remember final version coming. So I thought it was maybe when when the full court press was um, publishing. Yeah, probably around 74 in there, three, four, five, like in there. Yeah, also you can tell by the address uh, where Joe was living. I could do research and tell you when he lived there, but um, anyway. I know a, a lot of people on, on this, um, on this uh, webinar, know um, Joe Brainer, know his work, but do you want to say a few words about um, I Remember, which is just a kind of magical work and and also your your friendship with with him? Well, very briefly, because as you say, it's it's you know pretty well known. Uh, I, I bet 99% of the people with us today have read I Remember. <clears throat> uh, but uh, Joe and I met in the first grade uh, and then I went to a different school and we, re we reconnected in high school. And there he was a, obviously a very talented artist already. And I was a poet. I started a little magazine and I invited uh, my 
you see the picture in the middle from the newspaper, that's me on the left. And next to me is the poet Dick Gallup, who was my neighbor across the street and my close buddy. Next to him was a boy named Michael Marsh, who was also in our high school, a talented classical pianist and, uh, and an artist. And then Joe on the far right. And uh, I invited Joe to be the, uh, the art editor of this magazine called the White Dove Review. And you're flanking the photo of, from the paper, uh, the cover of the first issue and then the cover of the last issue. So we so, published, I'm sorry, go ahead, Karen. No, the first issue was 1959 and you were just 16, is that right? Uh, I was either 16 or maybe starting to turn 17, I can't remember. Uh, but when we when I started the venture and I asked Dick, my, my friend, uh, close friend, uh, you know, to be an editor with me. And he and I really sort of started to get things off the ground uh, by writing to Jack Kerouac and Allen Ginsberg and E.E. E. Cummings and all the, a lot of people whose work we admired. And a lot of them came through and, and sent us things. It was, <laughs> in retrospect, astounding. Uh, here here are two yeah. of them. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there's a postcard from E.E. E. Cummings to me. Uh, after I sent the query, I guess it must have been in late 59. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, notice he capitalized his name, uh, E, E, and C of coming. Uh, and then the thing on the right is a, uh, a letter I got from uh, Leroy Jones, uh, later called himself Amiri Baraka. And uh, Roy was uh, incredibly solicitous and helpful and avuncular to, uh, to me in getting this magazine off the ground. And also it helped me with some criticism of my own work. I sent him some poems of mine to, to uh, hoping he would publish them in his magazine, Yugen, which in fact had been an inspiration for the White Dove Review. And uh, he, he rejected the poems, but he, he said very nice, uh, encouraging and helpful things about it and was uh, just, um, was really terrific. He he used he kept using the word glad in these letters to you. He was so glad that you were doing all this work and so glad that you were sending poems and he, he seemed incredibly encouraging. Well, he was. Yeah, he was. Um, so I, I was curious your sort of growing feeling about about Tulsa as a as a place. So that I started with that that surrealism quotation from a little later, and then we've gone back to 59 in the early 60s. So I think this letter is from the summer of 59, um, where you write to, to Dick um, that, uh, that um, you're, you're very happy that Tulsa meaning so much to me, this is the last line, now you, I'm very glad. Um, and that lately you felt an exuberance there. Oh, maybe I used the word glad because Roy was using it all the time. I don't know, but... Uh... Yeah, Dick Gallup uh, was born and grew up in Greenfield, Massachusetts, until he was about nine or 10 years old when his family moved to Tulsa and into the house directly across the street from my family's house. And so uh, he maintained, his family maintained a, uh, close ties to the family back in Greenfield. And every, in fact, they spent a month, uh, August, every year uh, there. Uh, uh, so I, I guess I felt, I felt happy that Dick had finally come around to thinking of Tulsa as his his town and not Greenfield. I don't know why I thought that it was crazy, but I apparently did. Um, so uh, yeah, there's also some reference to uh, going to plant grass with Brainerd at the Elks Country Club, but they don't need us, so I have the day off. And uh, yeah, we we were Joe and I were high school boys just picking up odd jobs here and there. Um, anyway, yeah, it was nice to that, that Dick, uh, although, although his mother always maintained sort of her, her allegiance to Greenfield and always felt like an outsider in Tulsa, but uh, Dick, uh, being younger, adapted and, uh, and uh, it made me happy because I wanted him to, to have a sympathy for the things that I had some sympathy for. So you, you leave Tulsa to go to New York City uh, for college. Mm -hmm. And I was curious about this. Um, this is in your freshman year of college, I think from Ted Berrigan, who we haven't mentioned yet, um, who was back in Tulsa. 
And did you, he, I guess he wrote, who wrote that, but not quite it. Um, no, that was somebody in the mailroom at Columbia University wrote that, um, some, some, some local wit. Uh, but yeah, this was written in the fall, or did you see the, the postmark, November 20th, 1960. And I had just come to New York uh, about two months before that to start college at Columbia. And, uh, and uh, meanwhile, Joe was, had gone to art school in Dayton, Ohio, but very soon was getting ready. In fact, a month after this, Joe moved to quit art school and came to New York. But Ted was still back in Tulsa where he was a graduate student at the University of Tulsa. And um, he wrote to me, as you see there, uh, uh, he got the address all right, just put, or something like that. <laughs> that was the kind of wise guy thinks that uh, we're all, uh, not Joe so much, but Ted and I and Dick would often do with the, the postal system. Um, one time Ted and I, instead of using postage stamps, we put Christmas seals up there and the, the letters went through fine. We didn't, we didn't even have to buy stamps. <laughs> anyway. So um, I, I don't think this was, this wasn't the first class you took with Kenneth Koch um, at Columbia, was it? Or this was a later class? Did you take a, a bunch of them? Uh, I had three courses with Kenneth. The first one was my freshman year. It was one of those great books uh, uh, survey classes that went for three times a week for the entire year. And we started with, uh, what did we start with? I think we started with the Iliad and ended with Crime and Punishment, something like that. Uh, but that, and that was an unbelievable course. I mean, unbelievable. Uh, then subsequently I took this class from him. It was called 20th Century, it was called The Comic in Modern Literature, I think. Oh yeah, it says that on the front of the notebook. And I kept notes there, including uh, the reading list that he, uh, this reading list on the right, it, it says Saad Apollinaire, Le Tremont Jarry, Ilfen Petrov, uh, on and on. Uh, Raymond Roussel, he was recommending. Uh, this is 1962 or three, I think. Rob Lay, William Carlos Williams Patterson, Mahler May, on and on and on. Ashbury. Um, this was the, the books he's recommending were not on the reading list. These were supplemental reading he wanted us to do. <laughs> so, <laughs> it was a fabulous course. And uh, he was the best teacher I ever had by far. And I had some very, very good ones. Uh, the third class I took from him was actually, uh, what do you call it? where you just go visit the tutorial. And that was in, uh, we called it something like modern poetry and, and translation. And I met with Kenneth privately once a week in his office for a couple of hours. And we went over work I was doing. Well, that was really great too. I think I was a senior when I was, yeah, I was my senior year, yeah. So there in between the, the your um, first and second year of college, you go back to, to Tulsa and you don't seem to feel as happy anymore. Um, but I did love this phrase uh, I keep thinking that if I go somewhere else, even into another room, I'll escape this lethargy. That phrase, I keep thinking if I go somewhere else um, with, with this travel show, I kept thinking that that's, you know, just a way to change one's, one's, one's feeling, one's mood. But it seems like going back to Tulsa during college didn't feel the same as, as the way you'd felt before. Well, <clears throat> I should say that I, I was sort of, even as a high school boy, I was, I was eager to see some other place in the world. And I, I wanted to go either to New York or to San Francisco. I thought that would to go to school. And um, I ended up going to New York. But I, by the time my senior year in high school ended, I was ready to leave Tulsa for an, a lot of reasons. And uh, uh, okay, New York was an unbelievable, uh, unbelievable place to go uh, for, for a boy like me and, uh, <clears throat> and for Joe as well. Uh, and um, so going back to Tulsa after my uh, freshman year um, was a real kind of a, a crash. It was a come down. I felt like I'd slipped back somehow into a kind of psychology that I didn't want to be in and uh, in a cultural atmosphere I didn't want to be in. So I felt this, uh, I describe it as lethargy here, yeah. So you mentioned that that for Joe to um, being in New York was amazing. So these are some of the, this is S, um, a collaboration that you both did 
in an apartment in New York City while you were in college, right? I think it was maybe your senior year. Uh, no, uh, yeah, oh yeah, uh, yeah. Joe, Joe left New York in, in January, early January of 63, and he moved to Boston um, for various reasons. I go into it in the book I wrote about. Um, and then, but he came back in the fall and uh, he didn't have a place to stay. So he came and crashed in the apartment that, that um, my wife, uh, Pat, the Pat of the dear Pat and Ron, uh, we had rented, we had just gotten married that summer of 63. He came back and got this apartment up on 88th Street in, in Manhattan, West 88th near Broadway. And Joe came and lived in our, uh, slept in our living room, which is, we had, it was a one bedroom and it was a small apartment, but he stayed there for a couple of months. And during that time, we collaborated on these little tiny works. Um, uh, I can't remember how many, there are 50 or 60 or something. And we, we put them in, a, they're all the same size. We put them in a little box that had a gold metal letter S on it. And so we just called it S, the collaborate. So these are uh, some examples from those collaborations we did. We didn't have any, there was no studio for Joe to work in. We didn't have a lot of materials. It was all very, very simply done and quickly done too. Some of them came out pretty good and others came out really pretty awful. And uh, I can't stop myself from commenting. The one on the left is has a quotation from Victor Hugo, at least, uh, Say toi qui dors à l'ombre. Uh, and then it goes on, it says, l'ombre du tombeau, du mon amour. There's a grammatical mistake there. It should be de mon amour. And every time I see that, I cringe. But despite that, I think it's a very beautiful little piece. Uh, anyway, that was the story of that, that collaboration. Mm. And you wrote, you wrote a little bit about this in Joe and the uh, a memoir. Um, that he provided the that, that you provide you both provided some of the words I think and he provided the images is that right? Uh, he provided m most of the images, yeah, and I I provided most of the words though. He did a few, like you wrote thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, in uh, critical areas of the uh, <laughs> the <laughs> Tracy uh, yeah, thing and wow, yeah, but. Uh, oh. I like your description of we passed the pieces back and forth, drinking coffee and smoking. Joe and I were 21 and goofy. <laughs> yeah, I think that's it. Um, and then one more collaboration that I think was from this around the same time that I that I really love. It's, it's yeah, the, <clears throat> this one was a little bit later. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is around probably around 64, maybe the year later. But yeah, Joe, uh, Joe. Uh, Joe, I think Joe did the, yeah, Joe, Joe, Joe did the boxes and the word Cezanne. And then I think he wrote, I think I'll paint today. That looks like his handwriting. And I, I did the rest. Um, yeah, <laughs> I like this piece too. So we're gonna, a year later, you got a Fulbright and are off to Paris um, for the year of uh, 65, 66. That's right. Yeah. <clears throat> and you're yeah. married at this point. I think you, you and Pat married in back in Tulsa in 63. Is that right? That's right. June of 63. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. So uh, we gave up our apartment on 88th Street and and Miss Fulbright was enough. Uh, we, we had also, I think, five hundred dollars, maybe. And we we went to Paris on the on the, the, the France uh, it was a wonderful experience. And and it was uh, staggering. It was a staggering year for us both. Just wonderful. Uh, although we were living on the stipend for one student. So it was a pretty lean year for us uh, financially. But we had a lot of help, from, uh, at least uh, encouragement and advice from, from uh, the, then the Paris Review editor, uh, Maxine Grofsky, who was incredibly kind to us. And, um, uh, and also Harry Matthews. Uh, who was living in Paris and who gave us his apartment to, to apartment sit for two months when he was traveling. So uh, it wasn't all, you know, just la boheme, but it, it was, a lot of it was. And this is a, a postcard of the famous cabaret in old Montmartre um, uh, with the, as I say, a painting of the rabbit jumping around on the outside of the building. But it was a very uh, 
powerful year for both Pat and me. Uh, in, in this letter to Ted, um, I love the use of exclamation points. And here I am at last in Europe, <laughs> um, digging the streets as in days of wine roses in your get the beautiful city, get the instinctive understanding of French painting. And then at the end, um, so life once, so life has once again taken on some of that kind of excitement I first discovered five years ago in New York. And I, I love that, that um, you kind of move your exuberance from Tulsa then to New York, then to Paris. Well, I was young enough to have exuberance. Uh, <laughs> by the way, the expression digging the streets that's a, that's a paraphrase of something Allen Ginsberg wrote to me when I was still in Tulsa as a high school boy. And I was going to go to Mexico in the summer of 59, I think. And Alan wrote to me and his postcard said, dig the streets. <laughs> so Ted and I often would, you know, do variations on that. Also, uh, this, the line that says, get the beautiful city, get the instinctive understanding, um, get the is a takeoff on get the money. And I can't remember, Ted used to say that all the time. Maybe it was quoted from Damon Runyon, I don't know. But it was one of Ted's slogans, get the money. And so get the beautiful city. Uh, so there, there are all these kind of coded references to things in, in these correspondence, in, in language, in talk, in jokes. <laughs> yeah, this was... Uh, yeah, I had written a, a little uh, prose poem called Sky, by the way, and uh, which got published in, in England by Tom Rayworth, the poet, uh, uh, when he was running Goldyard Press, and he did a beautiful little card of it. It's quite nice. So this is a takeoff on that. And also Joe himself had started doing, quote, sky works as well. So I, I, I put this envelope in. I, I liked envelopes all the way through your papers because um, they they say so much about you know where you were and who you were writing to. Um, but but this one you started. Did you start translating? I guess you started in at Columbia, but you did some published translating for the Paris Review. Is that right? Uh, yes, I did. Uh, but by the way, this <clears throat> this Carol Paris Review is because uh, Pat and I were moving around. Uh, we stayed in a, a hotel in the Sixth Arrondissement originally, and then we moved over to Harry Matthews' place in the Seventh Arrondissement, and then back to the. And we ended up in. We spent a couple of months in the Eleventh Arrondissement, and then finally in the Eighteenth. So it was. It was. Uh, we didn't have a fixed address, in other words. But but uh, Maxine Grofsky was really nice, and she said, "You just get your mail here and come and collect it." So that's that's how that came about. Um, and what was the other thing you asked me though about? Oh, about translating. Oh, you translate. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Well, uh, near the end of uh, my Fulbright, uh, I had also made the acquaintance of another editor, a co-editor uh, of the Paris Review in Paris, uh, Larry Binsky. And Larry and I became friends and we went to the track together and uh, drank together and uh, not we didn't drink much, but we'd go across the street to the cafe to turn on and have something. But uh, Larry uh, was going to, uh, or the Paris Review was going to do one of those uh, writers at work interviews. And they had one with the, the French poet and fiction writer, Blaise Sandrard. And it was transcribed and edited from some radio interview that he had done because he had died in 63 and this was 66. They wanted to do a, an interview with him, a sort of uh, posthumous interview, let's call it. They wanted to include some poems by him. So Larry asked me if I would translate some. And, and in fact, he bought me the, the collected poems, and, which was wonderful. And, and I set to work and found that I really did like Sandra a lot more than I even thought I did. And so I gave Larry some versions and uh, um, he, he caught some grievous mistakes in them and uh, corrected them and made me look a little bit better than I was. Um, anyway, yeah. That's, uh, that was the beginning of the complete poems later. Was that was that job? Actually, yes. Um, uh, I, as I said, it kind of turned me on to Sandra, and also I had begun reading Sandra's prose because we didn't. Pat and I didn't have enough money to go out and do things. Um, 
And so I bought those Livre de Poche, these very cheap uh, uh, paperback editions of Sondra's massively long books. And I would spend uh, night after night in my hotel reading, just reading because I couldn't afford anything else. And um, I really fell in love with his work. And over the years, found myself translating this book or that book or uh, poems. And uh, eventually it kind of, amassed a, a huge numbers of them, almost complete. And then a, a editor at the University of California Press in, invited me to uh, do a Sondrard book. And I, I went back and there was one long poem of his, longish, called Easter in New York that I uh, had never been able to translate. And I went and worked on that and a few others. And that's how the, that book came about, the, the complete poems of Bliss Sondrard. But it all started with, really with Larry Bensky, um, asking me to do those poems for the Paris Review. So, so Paris was, it was the first time in France and it was also, oh, I forgot about this one. Um, this is a Ted Berrigan's award to you uh, while you're away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a little, oh. <laughs> he rhymes unique and freaked, which is a little <laughs> dubious rhyme, but uh, yeah, I'd sent him a, a manuscript of a long poem, which at that time I was called Donation Brock. And um, he, uh, <laughs> he seemed to like it. Yeah, it was great. So I was gonna say that then you, you go to England for the first time um, and you wrote this pretty amazing, this is just the first page, but it's a 10 page single space document, the London report. Um, and this first page has books that you're gonna get and a little map that Harry drew, Harry Matthews drew for you. Yeah, 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 yeah. This was kind of written I don't know who, who it was written for, but um, I did write it, uh, keep, keep a notebook, and then I transcribed it later, of this, uh, this brief stay in London. Uh, uh, I was invited over there uh, by uh, Tom Clark, the poet Tom Clark, who was the poetry editor of the Paris Review, but was also starting to publish his own um, editions. And uh, Tom was teaching in the uh, University of Essex and invited me over to do reading there. And um, somebody invited me to read in London at Better Books, uh, maybe the poet Lee Harwood, who was working there. Anyway, there was this kind of underground network of poets who were trying to be nice to each other and supportive. And Tom Clark was wonderful in that respect. Uh, and uh, anyway, I went over and stayed, Pat and I got to stay uh, uh, in the, uh, the apartment of uh, a woman named Diana Rose, who was a friend of Larry Binsky's at the time. And, and Larry came over, and so we had a wonderful time in London with them. And um, and then Pat and I went up to uh, Brightlingsea, which is where Tom was living near e in Essex. And uh, it was just a great trip. And um, you can see I'm uh, trying to get books that you couldn't get in the United States. One called Cronin Hot and Tolagos, the wonderful satirical play by Henry Carey. Uh, the autobiography of Flea, which was by Anonymous, it was a sort of famous pornographic classic. The Orators by Auden, I wanted to find the, the first edition and then other, other such things there. Uh, like William McGonagall's Poetic Gems and more Poetic Gems, a book Kenneth Koch had recommended uh, but wasn't available in the US. And uh, then there's a little map of where the bookstores are uh, that Harry Matthews uh, provided. So that was, that was a, a really a great little trip. So I know you were having an awesome time in in uh, in Europe, but you also seem to really miss your friends who are back in the U U.S. And so you had some of these collaborations that were through the mail, also I think. Yeah, this is the first page of of one. Um, I I found a, a photo roman in I think it was in German. I'm not sure. Uh, and I I I cut out certain of the the squares. Let's call them and the panels. And uh, I uh, whited out the words and I wrote uh, other words in. And I scrambled them all up and made this crazy non-sequential story. And, and uh, then I tried to make sense of it myself by writing in the dialogue and everything. And I sent the, the sketch of it all to Joe and he redrew the entire thing. And, uh, and that's, this, this collaboration came out, uh, it was done in, as you see, 66. But I'd done the preliminary work all in Paris in, in uh, yeah, that year. But it was a really a nice way, one other nice way, or just a natural way to keep in touch with Joe 
and with other friends of mine, uh, Ted and Dick, especially. Um, yes. I know you were you were thinking about Joe in some of the journals that you kept that that year, um, and on Joe's works, he takes up all of his pictures out, but he is invisible in them. He, that is, the pictures are filled with his energy. His energy. Yeah, this is a little pocket notebook I, I bought. And um, look, I was being the fancier out there on the left. Le Ivre, a pun on book and drunk. Um, anyway, and I'd drawn, I don't know why I drew this pinball machine. I got, oh, I got fascinated with pinball machines in Paris because the French were so crazy about them. And uh, I'd grown up with pinball machines myself and I loved them. And somehow I, I, I there was a, a, I came across a pinball machine. It was entirely mechanical. It was not, there's nothing electric about it. And I, I, I felt I had to do a drawing of it. I was going to actually write a book about pinball machines, believe it or not. Thank God I didn't. But in, in the same notebook, I started making note on, on Joe's work because I, at the time, I felt that no one had really written any, well, people had written hardly anything about his work at all. And uh, I wanted to, say something important about his work, or something useful. The, uh, and uh, so I began taking notes and uh, eventually it all, I, I realized I just don't know what to say. I don't know how to say it and I'm not good at this, uh, but yeah. So these are the, the sort of uh, evidence that I was at least trying. Uh, this is just one little note, there are many others, but I couldn't pull it all together and write anything convincing. I wasn't very good at writing prose, actually, uh, this kind of prose. Well, it's interesting because um, one of the letters that you wrote, like right after you came back from Paris, was about how in the middle of this letter you see, and since Paris, I've written even less of what we would think of as creative writing, although I've written since our arrival in France at least four or 500 pages of letters. And it was, it is amazing to see the letters that you wrote while, while you were in France, just typed single spaced pages of letters. Well, yeah, one had to type a uh, single space and take them all the way out to the margins because postage was expensive. And uh, uh, it was, it was a, a, a catastrophe to have to put two pages, two sheets of paper in the same envelope and pay more for the postage, international postage. And so, yeah, uh, but also I, 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 was, I was close to my friends and, uh, and you know, in, in, in Paris, I had some friends. I mean, I, I, Maxine was a friend and Harry, and, uh, and I met the, the American poet George Tisch there and, and his then girlfriend, Christine Grodziki, uh, now known as Christine Tisch. But, and it was nice, but I didn't see a lot of everybody. And so it was Pat and me and together uh, 24 hours a day for the whole year. And, uh, you know, after she got tired of hearing me jabber, uh, I would go to the typewriter and tap, tap, tap away to my friends. And it was wonderful to get mail back from them too. Uh, very, very, uh, made me incredibly happy. So, um, so you return and you go to Tulsa because uh, you had a child then, I think. Uh, well, uh, or you we came back first to New York. We came back to New York. We came up to Vermont to visit uh, Joe and Kenwood Elmsley. And then we went, we took our way to Tulsa because when we got off the ship coming back in New York, I had exactly 25 cents in my pocket. Thank God my mother who was traveling with her, her husband, uh, my stepfather at the time, uh, they, they met us at the uh, pier and gave us, I think a hundred dollars or something. And, Pat and I went down and stayed with uh, Ted Berrigan and Sandy Berrigan. Then we got to drive a car, you know, one of those things. And we drove to Tulsa because my parents' house, my parents had separated and divorced. The house was empty and it was so we could stay there for free and we could have some uh, support from Pat's family uh, because Pat was pregnant. And, uh, and in fact, our son was born in November of 66, just a few months after we got back from France. And um, so, yeah, we got back there and uh, spent, oh, I just, until uh, April. And then we came back and moved to New York for good. Um, um, so these are good. letters about presents that, that Joe is sending um, to you. And then you start to talk about uh, 
doing another collaboration that you had kind of started in Paris and that you were able to finish then through the mail from Tulsa to New York, I think. Yeah. 100,000 fleeing Hilda. Yeah, yeah. That was a headline. There was a Hurricane Hilda at the time. And uh, I, the headline just said 100,000 fleeing Hilda. <laughs> it's, Reminded me kind of like a, a play by Kenneth Koch or something. And uh, so that was a title I took, you know. And the middle of this letter, you see the word wonderful with excitement lines coming out of it uh, because Kenward and, and Joe had called us in Tulsa long distance. Uh, uh, it was different then. And it was just so great to hear their voices. Um, and uh, yeah. Oh, and you're continuing to think about Joe in this in this letter, um, where you're thinking about painting things the way they look, and that you're trying to write things as they are. Yeah, where is that? Because it's it, it needs some qualification. Oh yeah, I said last several months, even in Paris, I've had a similar urge to write it as it is. The result has nothing to do with realism for me, at least. Fortunately, I don't know what I'm talking about, <laughs> or I probably wouldn't be too interested in it. Um, that's it. Oh, anyway, uh, Karen, just a little note here. Uh, yeah. Maybe we should we're... advance quickly through these uh, slides because we're we only have X minutes left. Yeah. Here's the cover and the uh, some excerpts, or maybe the whole thing. These are. Yeah, the I cover. think we were just going to pass through them so that people get a get a sense of this book. Yeah. Because you see some of um, France in it, um, in some of these images, and, and then a book press publication. Yeah. And then you change the, the date um, when you finished it in 67. Yeah, because originally we, we, I thought it would be done in 66, and then it wasn't. So it didn't seem like a big deal. Like Joe had made a mistake up on, on the, uh, the, the printing number edition of, I think he had 3,000 <laughs> number to sign copies. <laughs> no, so I, I think I blacked that out or he did anyway. Yeah, well, we got this printed in Tulsa, the same printer that published the White W Review printed it. You know. And then you started sending it all over the place. Um, these next slides are, uh, this is a postcard to Ted where you were just asking him to uh, find places that might stock it, the book. Yeah, I was very enterprising. I, I, was, uh, I, I felt it was important not only to produce the work, but if you're gonna produce it, then get it around, you know, show it to people and stuff. Uh, and so uh, looking back, I was, I was, it wasn't that I expected anything big from it, I didn't. Uh, but I just thought, you know, people should, if they wanna see it, they should have the sh chance to, you know? Uh, yeah. So, this is, I, I put Tulsa Kid in there to give a sense that this, all this time in Tulsa ended up in this amazing book in 1979 that incorporated so much of what had happened um, before then in all these forms, collaborations and short poems and longer poems. Yeah, that book was uh, put together, uh, Kenwood Elmsley had started a small press called Z Press. And he asked me if, if I would publish a book with him. I was, of course, delighted. And I went and assembled a kind of a rag bag of prose, poetry, cartoons, what have you, uh, kind of on the model of the book that I'd done with Ted and Joe earlier called Bean Spasms. And, uh, and then uh, I put this photograph of myself on the cover and uh, called it Tulsa Kid. Uh, meaning in a way, not only child, but a joke, a Tulsa kid, you know, I don't know. It was a, <laughs> I don't know if that worked, but um, anyway, uh, it wasn't really though about Tulsa. The book isn't really about, this. some things are about it, but it's, it's not, it's really more just, as I said, a, a miscellaneous collection of stuff that I had, um, uh, yeah. Well, I like that phrase in that first postcard to, um, Joe Brainerd, The Living Surrealism. I yeah. thought that described in some way what Tulsa Kid was. <laughs> sort of, yeah. Um, so I know we were going to stop at around 4.45 um, for some questions. So 
uh, I thought we should get to Vermont. Oh. What do you think about that? Yeah, let's go there. Okay. Actually, I'm already there. That's where I am right now. So, <laughs> so do you want to talk a little bit about cows? So it's the first time you went is 1966. Is that right? Uh, no, 65. Uh, uh, Kenwood Elmsley had uh, bought uh, with his companion in the 50s, uh, John Latouche, they had bought an old farmhouse in Vermont and in Calais, Vermont. And um, Latouche had died and Kenwood had taken over the whole property. And, and uh, he invited uh, Joe, uh, who had become his lover, uh, and, and Pat and me to, to come and visit this place. And uh, we, he, Kenwood drove us up in his ancient Mercedes Benz convertible he had. And uh, we came up here and it was seemed very remote and incredibly beautiful and wonderful. And uh, so we spent, I think maybe a week here and then uh, we, Pat and I went back to New York and, uh, and uh, I think on the bus, and then we went to Europe, we went to, to Paris. Um, and then when we came back from Paris, Pat was pregnant and we came back to, to Calais uh, briefly before going on to Tulsa. But uh, Calais was a place that uh, somebody should write the history of this property and this house and the people, all the incredible people who have come and spent time here. With, as Kenward's guest, it's really a phenomenal story to be told. Um, yeah, I wrote this this letter to Ted. I guess it says August of '66, so I, I was still up here, and Pat was, as I said, pregnant, and it was before we'd gone back to uh, to um, gone back to New York and then to Tulsa. But that that paragraph still, it's a big happy family, everybody busy. It's the everybody busy. It was a kind of busy, it seemed that, um, I mean, you seem to be very prolific. There's so, in your archive, there's so many um, poems that have Callis uh, as the place where you where you wrote it. And it and um, in the introduction to Sindar's, uh, you wrote one summer in the country surrounded by quiet and trees. You could really start to translate um, Eastern New York. And it seemed to have such an effect on your on your poetic output. Well, uh, it was very inspiring to be up here. Initially, Pat and I and Wayne, my baby Wayne, sta stayed with Kenrod as his guest every summer for longer and longer periods until we finally built our own little hut. Um, but um, everybody was busy. Joe worked all day uh, and uh, Kenwood worked like a fiend also on all kinds of projects. And so, and people who came to visit, Tom Clark, he was writing poetry while he was here. And uh, Jimmy Schuyler and John Ashbery, uh, it seemed like the, the creative people who came here found it a very uh, uh, inspiring place to be, partly because it was quiet and, and everybody who was here was off in their own nook and cranny uh, doing their own work and not bothering you. And then we would of course get together and take car trips or uh, do nearby towns or, or always have dinner and lunch together. So it was wonderful. It was like a retreat from the, for me, from the, the sort of overpopulation of New York. This is one of the things you made there, I think. Yeah, we did this in about the some 72 or so, based on, on uh, Joe or Kenward's postcard collection. We selected postcards and rearranged them, and then I wrote something to go with it. Yeah. And even when you weren't there, you often wrote about being there. Um, yeah, visions, um, visions of Vermont. Visions of Vermont, yeah, yeah. And in this postcard, you write, um, nature, my greatest objet trouvé. <laughs> <laughs> I, kind of a conceptual idea there. <laughs> Maybe you want to put it that way. Yeah, this is to Trevor Wingfield. Uh, it says, I do miss the Cedar, ham Cedar Bar hamburger. Trevor and I used to have lunch at the Cedar and, and always have a hamburger, always have a hamburger. But um, uh, anyway, and we were always joking about insulation art too. So that's partly this. Yeah. 